Hello everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Q and Play, my monthly Q&A series where I answer your questions in a rambly, unscripted format. The first question comes from Malted Meal. I really like the jazz you feature on your channel. I think it's super interesting hearing about other people's music choices. That said, what would you say your top two to three favorite bands, performers, slash artists are, and how often do you listen to them? I'm gonna be honest here, I don't really have like an obsession with any sort of band, performer, or artist. I just kind of like songs. There are bands that I like, but there's none that I would put in my like top three of all time. Like I really love Fiona Apple, but I don't listen to every Fiona Apple song. I listen to Criminal and Fast As You Can. I think those are incredible songs and I love a lot of her catalog, but I've seen people who are like hardcore Swifties or huge fans of Metallica as a casual listener of Metallica. And I don't come close to that kind of love. Sometimes I feel like I'm kind of missing out. I'm not really a part of any sort of music communities. I'm just a casual listener of a lot of things. But right now, what I'm really enjoying is Nine Inch Nails. I've been enjoying a lot of Nine Inch Nails tunes, like One Million or Discipline. I've been getting back into Lucky Chops on the brass band end, and yeah, their music has always been incredible. Lucky Chops, Too Many Zoos, Moon Hooch, they're all street performers in New York, and they're all incredible buskers. I mean, seriously, next level music. I didn't listen to them much over the past year because I got into the funk vibe, which doesn't really match their style, but as I distanced myself from them, I started coming back to their music and really loving it again. Sometimes you gotta take a break from tunes, you know? You don't wanna listen to the same thing over and over and over again. Not to say I don't listen to funk anymore, because I still do. And finally, old school, Bobby Blue Bland. Oh my god, this man is a legend. If you love Spider-Verse, you would have heard his song at the end of that movie, and trust me, I was freaking out when Ain't No Love in the Heart of the City came out of that record player. Oh my god, Uncle Aaron's got some good taste in music. I was freaking out more about that song than I was about the final twist at the end of the film. But yeah, there you go, a little preview of my favorite music, at least right now. Question from Irritable Izzy. Kind of a weird, hyper-specific question, but how long do you think is too long for a D&D game to be played, like in total? When is it time to call it quits? Whenever I feel the energy in the room sort of deflating, that's when I call it quits. That happened recently. I played an in-person game that started way later than it should have, and we were going until like 1 a.m. And I realized, okay, anything past this is not going to be it. Now, could we have gone past that? Maybe. Maybe the energy would have picked up. In fact, I kind of sensed that it was picking up due to some really clever moves from the players, getting them hyped up in combat. However, for the most part, not only were they getting tired, I was getting tired. And look, even though that game only lasted two hours, I think it was time to call it. I mean, it was already really, really late, and I didn't want to continue the session if it meant having the players have less fun in a really cool set piece. I don't want to waste an epic boss fight on a tired party. I would rather them go to sleep, take a long rest, or, you know, a few long rests, and then have us have another session so that we are more energized and more active and we don't waste a cool moment. Now, usually my D&D games are much longer than two hours. Usually about three hours is is the max that we go to. We start pretty late, 9 to 10 is when we generally start our games, and that means we're playing until, you know, midnight to 1 a.m., and I don't want to stay up too late for Dungeon Dragons. I love this game, but I also love my sleep schedule. Now, does that mean that I've never played crazy late for crazy long? No. The final session of my second full homebrew campaign, Descent into the Veil, lasted six to seven hours. We played until 4 a.m. But that was a very specific and special scenario, to say the least. But yeah, I don't think there's a set time where D&D needs to stop or any TTRPG needs to stop. I think you just need to be able to read the room and see how much energy is left in the people around you and how much energy is left in you. Because if you as the dungeon master can't run the game, it just is not gonna happen. Question from Starhound9354. What is the most shameless thing you've stolen from the media you consume? It can be anything for a D&D game, though if you've stolen something off a set somewhere, that's cool too. I can't say I've ever stolen anything literally, at least I'm not gonna say anything out loud on camera, are you insane? But anyway, the most shameless thing that I've stolen from the media I consume would probably be the pyramid ships from Destiny. I really love the design of the Black Fleet. It is absolute pinnacle, a very simple design that has a lot of meaning in that universe. Pyramids just freak people out, I don't know why. Destiny is not the first franchise to put big black pyramids as the 
main bad guys. It happens a lot in alien movies too. And yeah, I wanted to do that too, especially in my own Lovecraftian horror aspects of my world, which if you've watched Shadow for Kerkonos, you would know is a very big part of many of my adventures. In my world, these pyramids are not really ships. They're more like eggs or seeds. They're physical manifestations of beings within the hungering cosmos, a realm that exists beyond the world of Eris, beyond all realms, a twisting, swirling blackness filled with eldritch monstrosities that would break your very mind. Mind. The purpose of these seeds or ships is not truly known to scholars. That's something that I do a lot in my world is keep things ambiguous and let my players theorize. The reason they're called seeds though is because horrific things grow out of them. The land itself is reshaped and reformed around these ships. The trees they grow bear extremely horrifying fruit or at least horrifying to us. I don't know why, but I really like the idea of Lovecraftian horror as like a nature allegory. I don't know, growing, consuming, these are all natural processes and applying them to extremely alien entities. I don't know why, it's just, it's just cool. But anyway, the design of these seeds, they are directly stolen from Destiny. Though I can't say I stole the story of the Black Fleet because when I initially wrote this concept, I didn't know what the story of the Black Fleet was. It hadn't yet been revealed. I've stolen plenty of other things, but I've talked about them before. That's a new one for you guys. Question from Mr. Hanitzer GT. How would you recommend to write an application to a D&D campaign? Most applications are Google Forms. Fill in the blanks. Another thing, and I can't believe I need to say this, but seriously guys, be truthful. Do not lie on an application for a game you're playing for fun. Because if you lie and you end up not being a good fit for the group, then that's your own friggin' fault, dude. On that note, I think rejection from a D&D campaign is different from, like, rejection from a job. With a job, you're trying to get paid, but with a D&D game, again, you're playing it for fun. And therefore, if somebody turns you down, the Dungeon Master more specifically, then that's probably for the best. They probably just don't think you're a good fit for the group, and that's saving you guys both a heap of trouble. If you want to know the reason behind your application rejection, I don't think it's completely out of left field to ask. It might help you write different ones in the future. However, I think what you're going to find is that you're going to get rejected a lot just because you don't fit into every campaign. In fact, all of us don't fit into most campaigns. You gotta find what you're going to fit with, and maybe even what you're willing to adapt to. I don't really have a, oh, if you do this, you're gonna find a D&D campaign, you're gonna be accepted in a heartbeat, because that's not really how it works. You just gotta try and find something that fits you and your taste. Question from Radius Ignis. You mentioned in a recent video that you prefer to play games from series you already enjoy. Obviously, Destiny is one of these, but what other game series do you enjoy and why? The only series I've played for a really long time is Sonic, and obviously that game series is not always of quality, and therefore I don't always buy every single game right off the shelves. Honestly, Destiny's the only series where I am consistently buying new experiences. Something like Minecraft, I've played for years, but Minecraft is not a game that has new games coming out in the main series. It just has one game that I mod a lot. So yeah, I'm not exactly buying new things. I'm just playing the same game with new tweaks or changes, either introduced by the developers or introduced by me. There are a bunch of franchises that came in the PS4 generation that I have just fallen in love with. I mean, the current God of War games, Horizon, Ghost of Tsushima, I'm sure is getting a sequel at some point. All of these games, while they don't have a lot of games in the current series, there's only like two at most, I am positive there's going to be more, and I'm positive that I'm going to be one of the first people in line to get them. Honestly, I've been playing a lot of new games recently. I just got my hands on Cyberpunk, which I'm planning on playing after I finish Baldur's Gate 3. Obviously, I'm playing Baldur's Gate 3, and I'm finally like really getting into it and enjoying it, which feels really great. However, right now, video games aren't at the top of my mind. I'm in the middle of my autumn of creativity. I'm working on a bunch of creative craft projects. Projects. I'm painting again, I'm working on a cosplay, I'm building a big Lego set, so there's a lot of other fun projects that take up the time that I would usually be playing video games with. Now, not to say I don't like video games anymore, still love video games, I just have other hobbies that I'm trying to prioritize because I want to, you know, change things up this season. Question from Anarchy1765. In one of your videos, you mentioned a Reddit user named Flip and Flop and said, if you know, you know. Thing is, I don't know. So who's Flip and Flop? Oh my friend, prepare to hear a story. Flip and Flop is a user that posted to the drug subreddit asking about a drug called Datura. 
Now, if you're in the know about Datura, you know you definitely shouldn't take it. I mean, even people that have taken some really hard stuff will tell you not to take Datura. Not only does the trip really, really, really suck, but also Datura is extremely poisonous and not in the drug kind of way, in the lethal kind of way. It is extremely dangerous to take Datura in any form. Flip and Flop had outlined a plan to take Datura in various forms all at once, and obviously with such a dangerous substance, taking any of it is a bad idea. Taking that much is a super bad idea, and people told this person that, and from what we can tell, they did not listen. Their Reddit profile starts showing erratic behavior, with people flocking to the comments to ask this person if they're okay, asking them to let us know when the trip wore off. However, user Flip and Flop never returned. To this day, their profile is silent, and no one knows what their ultimate fate was, or if they even survived their final trip. Okay, no. at the end, reality time. This is a Reddit story, and remember that people can create profiles very, very easily. Who knows? Maybe Flip and Flop just wanted to cap off their Reddit history with a crazy situation. There are a few things that don't line up. There's a great Nexpo video covering Flip and Flop, but honestly, I do understand the line of thinking that a lot of people call this fake just because we don't want it to be real. I mean, I don't want it to be real because if it is, that would. Huh. That would really suck. But there you go. The tragedy of Darth Flip and Flop the Detura Taker. Question from Weirdly Curly Plant Stem 8231. Are there any DD rules or mechanics that you particularly dislike? Not really. DD isn't like Baldur's Gate or Destiny, where if I don't like a ruler mechanic, there's nothing I can do about it other than eat crap. With DD, if I don't like a ruler mechanic, I just change it. It's not really that big of a deal to me. Honestly, people who do get really upset about rules or mechanics in DD or tabletop role playing games, like, I get it. There are mechanics that are stupid and annoying, but can't you and your group, like, do something about that? You know? The biggest rule change I think that my game makes is mostly just content stuff. Like, we revamped the monster manual and added Flea Moyles in as the core monster mechanic set of our D&D &D game. We changed up all the races and classes using my own homebrew tales from the tavern material. It's mostly just content shifts, not really rules or mechanics. I like the rules and mechanics of D&D. There are some small things I do, like you can take a potion with a bonus action or something like that. But for the most part, things that bother me in D&D, it's content related, not rules related. I like the rules a lot. It's the content around the rules where I'm like, okay, that could definitely be better. The entirety of the base monster manual. The existence of Horde of the Dragon Queen. Yeah, <clears throat> sorry, habit. But yeah, mostly it's content stuff that I dislike when it comes to D&D rules. One of these days, I'm gonna be brave enough to release my full patch notes. Honestly, it really scares me because people get really, really up their bums about D&D rules and mechanics in other people's games. As I said earlier, I don't get that, but maybe one day I'll muster up the courage. Question from Mind Flame Blade 8788. You sound like a Minecraft character with a hoodie skin. Anyway, if you've been playing Baldur's Gate 3, who's your favorite companion so far? Gale and Carlac are my favorites so far. I have not the faintest clue who Gale is, but they sound great. Carlac's cool too. Right now, I've got Asterion, Shadowheart, Will, and Carlac in my camp. I feel like that's not all the companions in the game. There are more on the cover, so. I don't know where they are. That gith lady just disappeared into the void. No idea what happened to her. All the characters I just listed though, I love every single one of them. Will is just, I mean, come on. That guy is my brother. He is the best friend character I've had in any sort of game in a long time. Like, he's just so cool and classy and awesome. I love him. I've kept online discourse about Baldur's Gate 3 to a minimum throughout my playthrough. I want to get as little spoilers as possible, but I am aware that Will is on the underrated end, which was crazy to me. My other favorite is Shadowheart. At first, I only really talked to her because her voice actress just has such a great, alluring, and beautiful voice. I just wanted to hear more of it, but as I started to peel back the layers of Shadow Hearts character, I realized he was a massive dork underneath all the edginess, and you know what? That's adorable and amazing, and she's awesome. As for the character that I am playing, I'm playing Kali Solfero from Shadow Over Kerkonos. 
She is an assassin rogue and is great at murdering people from a distance. I really do love playing as an assassin rogue in this game. It has a really satisfying gameplay loop. I do think, and this might be surprising to you guys, but I do think I am going to pursue a romance. I think Kalia and Shadowheart could be a cool pairing, even though obviously in the canon of my games, Kalia does have an established partner already. Kalia and Shadowheart are shockingly similar characters in a lot of ways, and I think that as Shadowheart reveals her backstory and personality, I could see Kalia growing really close to her, even in a romantic sense. I think that that does make sense for her character. The big major difference, and the thing that made me hesitate with pursuing the romantic angle with that relationship, is the religious thing. Kalia is not a very religious person, and she's definitely not down with any sort of god like Shar. Obviously, Shar doesn't exist in the universe Kalia is from, but I'm assuming in this world of the Forgotten Realms, Kalia is the same way when it comes to dark entities. She doesn't think very highly of them, so that might be a blockage in the relationship. Though, I do have a feeling I can get Shadowheart away from her uh, creepy cult thing because, I don't know, the game seems to be pushing me in that direction. Or maybe I'm just in denial. Who knows? No spoilers, I swear to God. I'll ban you for life. I think this will be the first time I've ever done a romance in any sort of role-playing game. So, yeah, new experience for me. I hope I enjoy it. I think it's gonna be cool. All right, and that is a wrap for today's episode of Q and Play. If you guys enjoyed, then please do leave a like. If you want to see more of our content, then you can check out our Shadow Over Karakonos D&D podcast, the place where Kalia Solfero originates. It's linked in the cards. And while you're there, subscribe to Crispy's Tavern to get more of our content as it comes out. And finally, if you want to leave your own questions or thoughts, go down to the comments down below. If you can't think of comment, leave the comment absolute to reference the game I'm playing in the background and to let me know if it's the end of the video. But anyway, in essence, like, comment, subscribe. I will see you all next time. Farewell. Farewell.